Uh, hi, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about my youth project. I'm from Poles. For those of you who doesn't know, it's Poles Organization and Leadership Sets, one of the master uh, courses here at Stanford. And my goal with this project was to understand a little bit more about scaling, the meaning of scaling, uh, especially when we talk about nonprofits. Um, so yeah, the goal of this project was explore about, more about scaling in the nonprofit world. Uh, just so you know, this is the timeline we followed. Uh, we have, I did it uh, in partnership with, with someone from my cohort, and we have been working on this project for the last five months. Um, and to start with a full overview, as I said, the goal was to learn how nonprofit organizations are able to scale the impact. We did it in partnership with Team for Tech, a nonprofit here in the US. And we had mainly two approaches. We conducted uh, two case studies uh, with uh, some of uh, Team for Tech's grantees. And we also uh, researched um, some definitions of scaling. And we found a good uh, framework that defines the scaling in four dimensions. Uh, so my agenda for today, I will, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Team Project, give you an overview. I'm gonna talk about the four dimensions of scaling. Very quick. The quality of- It's becoming fun. If you could move Pedro down first. Okay. So their mission is to improve the quality of education for under yeah, under resource learners by building nonprofit capacity uh through technology and training. And they envision a world where all learners have access to a better education. Uh, I brought here their theory of change. It explains a little bit better uh, how Team Protect works. They partner with nonprofits, corporate partners like technology companies and donors who give them the money uh, to enable nonprofits to build their capacity, mainly technology, and also. Uh, uh, provide learners uh, skills they need, and this way they help nonprofit scale, scale, and with the impact that nonprofits do, they are able to achieve uh, each time more uh, students and adults uh, with better uh, education results. Uh, and just their impact, they are global. They have worked in India, Africa. Uh, North America and they are starting to work in South America as well. Okay, so uh, the four dimensions of scaling. Uh, I, I feel like every time we think about scale, we think about numbers. So I started yeah. a company with two students and now I have 4 million. But what we found out here is that there's more than that. For example, if I have a school with 100 students, but I do a really like deep, uh, uh, transformational change and I offer them like a very, very good uh, education. I'm also doing somehow uh, change and scaling my work. So uh, with the, the, this uh, paper brings here four definitions, four pillars uh, that contain scale. So the first one is uh, that, uh, and it's basically what I said, uh, making a deep uh, transformation and going like beyond surface, altering people's beliefs, uh, interaction, principles. The second one is spread. So growing numbers, I go from two students to 1,000, 1 million. Uh, the third one is ownership. Uh, every time I think about change, if I wanna create my nonprofit or make some change, it's like, I cannot be the only one that understands what I want to do and the change I want to do. So everybody involved, involved needs to feel like they are also, they also have ownership for the change we are doing. Uh, in this case, everybody that works in the nonprofit needs to be responsible for the change we are doing. And uh, finally, sustainability. So 
we have to make sure that the change we are doing and the work that nonprofits are doing will keep going uh, and will uh, sustain over the time. This is thing. Okay. And uh, recording and so once organizations have at least most of those four pillars, they are also able to scale outside their organization. So we start to impact, make some impact in the ecosystem, the community they work. Uh, so go beyond what they already do. Uh, the case studies we st studied, uh, there were two. The first one is sleep. It's a South Africa um, network of school. They serve uh, low-income students. Uh, they don't charge any fee. They have six uh, schools. And um, they have started with 80 students, and now they have 2,000 students. But they have some limitation because they are, they have like fiscal schools, so they are not able to grow as much as like five thousand students. They can grow much more than they have already uh, grown. But uh, when we think about that, uh, the impact they have done in the life of those students, uh, low income students, uh, it's something really transform transformative. Uh, so this is one main point. And now they, that they have already like established themselves, they are also uh, doing some tra teacher training. Uh, they will start to work with the government. Although for South Africa, the context is kind of similar to Brazil. So we did some interview with the CEO and he's, he was at that point a little bit frustrated uh, with how much work scale he can reach. Uh, to the government, but he's going step by step making some impact there. And the other one, it's called DOST. It's a mobile-based early childhood uh, education so solution. So they serve um, caregivers and parents in uh, rural areas in India. Um, what they do is they send uh, phone audios every day uh, to the par parents uh, with social emotional learning, uh, learnings and also like daily routines. And those parents, they have children that doesn't go, don't go to school yet, but those, this contact helps uh, the children to get prepared for the time they are going to school. So uh, uh, this is, the, and they serve like areas that have no access to technology. Uh, and this is different once they have like a, a online solution, uh, they started with 10,000 uh, parents and they have already reached like 100,000 parents and they their goal is to reach like 4 million in the next two years. And they have worked together with the government to uh, scale in numbers even more. So uh, yeah, it's nice to see uh, two very nice examples of nonprofits. There are, successful in their own country, own region, but in very different ways. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so just to wrap up, because uh, of the time I had to uh, make it short, but uh, for, for me personally, I feel like this project uh, gave me uh, more context about what is happening globally uh, in the nonprofit world. Uh, Team Protect works with more than 40 uh, nonprofits all over the globe. So that was a very nice knowledge to have. I changed a lot my mindset about scaling and impact. I feel like coming from the business world, I always think about change, uh, scaling in numbers. And it's nice to see how impact uh, and change can happen. Not only if you need to achieve like reach, uh, a very big number of people. You can also do it, start at least local and scale in different ways. And to finish, uh, it was also nice to recognize some common characteristics of the of both uh, NGOs. So they both have a strong leadership. Uh, they both have a very strong mission. Uh, they know where they wanted to go since the beginning, and they have like they have deep deep roots. Uh, so they have a structure, a very strong uh, base. So they, when the opportunity came for them to grow in numbers or, or impact, they were like 
uh, ready to do it and they were able to do it. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> hey, thank you, Fernando. We have three or four minutes for questions. I have one question. I mean, you didn't talk about the finances of scaling, but obviously, if, if you're a nonprofit or particularly if you're dependent on philanthropy or donations, yes. that's a key dimension of scaling, right? Is can can you raise the money that's necessary to do the work? Did you did you look yeah. at that at all? Uh, we didn't. Uh, in both cases, they had that. So Liv had John Gilmore, the founder, he has some connections and he's one of the main donors. So this is kind of not a problem for the size they have right now. And those, uh, since they are partnering with the government, uh, they are also able to collect more resources and stuff. But I, I know this is uh, something that can... Um, be yeah. a, a challenge. If any of you are thinking of starting nonprofits, it's a big challenge. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Fernando has a question, and uh, Eduardo, why don't you get started plugging in your sure. computer so that uh, uh, Fernando? Thank you. So, thank you for the presentation, Fernanda. Uh, I just wanted to build on what you said that you said you changed your mind a lot uh, going through the project. I wanted to, to ask you. What do you what did you um, did you change your mind or did you build a vision of what what people usually get wrong when they talk about scale? Because this talk is all around, right? People always ask nonprofits, how do you scale up? Do you think people are looking, uh, what, what, what are they missing? What did you find out uh, on those changes of your mind that people are usually missing? I, I feel like at, at the beginning, for example, uh, me and my partner were, were thinking like, okay, let's associate a scale with numbers. And I, I feel like what people can start doing, it's asking what kind of scale they want when they start some project or uh, do and disconnect a little bit. Maybe they don't need to grow in numbers if they do like a very deep impact it's already enough uh and it's also like a first step maybe in the future they can grow in different ways but i feel like asking the question what scale means for me like what i want from that it's the uh, main change here for my mindset thank you for the question thank you, thank you. we have time for one more question i can ask um <clears throat> thank you for your presentation uh, i was wondering uh, what do you think was your biggest challenge in the whole program or in the project that, that you chose? If you can talk a little bit about it. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I, I talked, uh, we, at the beginning we were trying to find one specific uh, like Balaj Prato, mm -hmm. one specific thing that would, if nonprofits have this, they are able to scale anyway. And uh, the conclusion we got is like, there is no uh, like one specific thing that you can do. You have to first like define what you want, understand your local context. And uh, I, there are a lot of ways you can go wherever you want. So, yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Fernanda. Right on time, perfect. Thank Good. you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. All. Okay, so before uh, before Eduardo starts, I just want to acknowledge that three of the students who will enter uh, this fall are have joined us for this seminar. So you're not only are you informing one another, you are inspiring the next generation of master students in the Lemon Center. But uh, Helen Sosa, uh, Anna Marini, and Franciela Santos are with us this morning and. Uh, Welcome, and we'll look forward to seeing you here uh, in September. Okay, Eduardo. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. This is my the, the research I've been working with. I'd like to thank especially for Professor Cornoy, who's my advisor, and also to Gabriel, the PhD student, who's been really cooperative and helpful for me. And I'm going to be looking into differences, like inequalities between um, Achievement, achievement gaps between public and private schools in Brazil. Okay. When when we think of private and public schools in Brazil, what do what comes to mind? I feel for most of us, we have the impression we we know that uh, private schools are they perform better. Private school students perform better than um, public school students on average. 
And you can see this here, this is from uh, 2017 data from Saebi, right? And this is private. So for, and this is uh, different uh, socioeconomic uh, levels, right? So you can see for like the poor students in uh, private, they have an average, average of 222 score and the poorest in public have 207. And this pattern is very consistent. So for every, so if you compare students from the same background, they all perform better in private schools. And why is that? Part of, uh, part of we know there, there's a strong correlation between a series of variables, right? And student performance. So I know students who have higher income, whose parents are more educated, they perform better on average, right? And private schools attract more of those students, right? So the, the subsequent answer, the question is, so, okay, so, Private school students are performing better than public school students, but they're also they come to school when they like for out of the gate they have better um, observable characteristics, right? What if we could filter this out and compare, like say, like if we have the same identical like cohort of students attend public and private schools, how would they perform? So this is where I'm I'm doing here, I'm simulating an experiment with that based on on this huge data set we have in Brazil. Right. This is another layer of inequality within um, the Brazilian society, but specifically school system. One is black and zero is white. Right. So even within public systems, when we get students from the same sort of like similar background, the black students perform sick, like way worse than white students for every income bracket. And the same for private, because you can say, oh, private schools are way better. Like. All students have the same opportunity there. They are exposed to better teachers, better resources, but it's not the case, right? If you get uh, black and white students from the same income bracket, from similar income brackets, they also perform um, better. So what I'm trying to answer in this research is, okay, so let's, let's assume that we're getting the stylized uh, cohort of students and send them to like private and, and public schools. So let's see how they fare. It's a simulation. Right, and this is a distribution of the 2017 sample of schools. This is public, right? So we see like most schools, like 27,000, this huge number is like on the middle, have very little schools who average on the top. And also very like little, like a small number of schools where like everyone is very poor, right? It's sort of like, looks like a normal distribution. Whereas for private, you see like all, big majority, like 75% of schools approximately are wealthy or better off, right? So how, if we could like reproduce this curve here and what would happen? What would be the results, right? This is uh, the actual scores for uh, the year 2011 to 2017. This is uh, public. This is for uh, the SAB math. Uh, exam, right? I'm, I'll, all throughout the presentation, I'm going to be working with the math exam. And this is uh, public and this is private, right? We see the gap narrowing a little bit in 2015 and um, sort of widening a little bit, but not that much. I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm sure you cannot see it really well, but this is uh, the regression tables. We see the coefficients for um, as uh, an educator of socioeconomic uh, conditions, the mean socioeconomic conditions of school, the student age. So it's the student age is measuring if the student is out of his uh, proper age for that year, rural age of school entry, which is a, an indicator, a proxy for uh, preschool attendance. Why? Oh my God. Okay, <laughs> black. You asked. Yeah, and constant. So it's what, what I can say here is like for both public and private, they're all very significant. I mean, not very, but they're significant at a 1% level. So it's pretty tight. And so let's go to the next. Let's, so how, if we filter this differences in socioeconomic status and other observable variables, what would happen to the performance of students? And this is the simulation we got. So this is actual scores, and this is the predicted scores if students, if we're sending the same, um, cohort for both, like the same students with the same characteristics. So there's no difference in the private schools don't have this advantage anymore. 
So it's relying only on variations of like teacher quality, resources, all sorts of uh, variables that are not observable in students. And what we see here is that in 2015, uh, you know, the prediction for, uh, for public schools, they surpass uh, private schools. And this goes on to 2017 and the gap widens even more, right? We have the bottom, uh, this is the scores for the bottom 20% SES for public and private. And we see the same pattern that uh, uh, private schools get, it gets like lower, the, the achievement gap sort of reverses. And we see the same pattern, but more extreme for uh, top 20% schools, because sometimes we feel like, oh, okay, but you know, we have this like 10% or 20% private schools who are like elite and they're very good and they're out of this world. But when you compare, you know, students who are like top 20% SES from public also, they're doing way better than the rest of the sample for, for private. And you might say, oh, this is like, this is weird. You know, like, why is this happening only in now? And well, I cannot tell this. Uh, from my from the data I've seen now, why is this happening? Why is uh, why are private schools sort of like being um, surpassed by public schools? But what I can say is that there's a uh, if we look at data from PISA, which is uh, global, we this is just the share of students who are. I maybe I should have said that in the beginning, but like in Brazil, the early 2000s, we had 10% of students in private schools, but now it's 20. So it's become, I feel like it's become more relevant to study that. And this is um, a very important uh, data from OECD that this is before controlling for, um, for SES and after controlling. So if we have the blue bar on this side, pub public schools have higher scores controlling for everything. So but Uruguay, uh, the, the OCD average actually, Public schools perform better than private, right? When when you con uh, control for SES, uh, Mexico, Indonesia, Thailand, so like countries and, and Brazil, it's the it doesn't it's not in advent in like the private public schools are not getting not ahead, but it reduces a lot, and this gap is uh, decreasing. So. But mind you that this is uh, students who are 15 years old and fifth, fifth grade students are 10 years old. So, right, this is like five years after they, they said, it might be the samples are uh, different, but it might, um, and this is this is the older data, this is from 2011. And I just wanted to, huh? no, go ahead. I, I just wanted to show where you at the USA stands here. Um, it's here, right? So for the USA, public schools are also uh, perform better when controlled for SES. So um, what I, I, at first I was like, oh, this is, uh, I, I wasn't familiar with this data yet. And I was like, oh, this is weird. Why is this happening? Why are uh, private schools losing the advantage? But what I realized is actually Brazil is joining a trend that's happened in a lots of countries where, and if the average OECD, which is like all like 18, 20, like richer, rich, richest countries in there on the world, they all have no differences, no like controlling for SES, it's zero, right? So this is what I've noticed by this research. And now I'm gonna go deeper into why, you know, what, what is going on in terms of Maybe including like teacher variables. We know that teachers are a big uh, part of this difference. And we're going to explore the data sets to see what's what's going on. If we can see anything, and also break down by state, see how this uh, difference is playing out in different states in Brazil, because this is national data, and also include more years. That's over. Okay, just last comment. Yeah, just include more years because it goes from 2011 to 2017. I haven't included 2019 because there's no gender, as we all know, weirdly, but that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Very amazing presentation. I, I didn't, I couldn't imagine that. If I, if I understood correctly, the value added by the uh, private school in the average is lower than the value added 
because you're controlled yeah. than well, the public school. If we put yeah, I I get the idea. Yeah, I just point. wouldn't call value added because I feel like there's a specific methodology for measuring sure, sure. value added. But yeah, I think like the in terms the of the value added to the what, score, what this what the school is adding, yeah, it's, to the score. Okay, yes, That's very interesting. So it means that the, it the didn't background the case it changed. And we oh. don't, we're not right when we see the, da the, the data from like 2011, 2013. And that's why I'm curious to look back like 20, even stretching back to 1999 to see how. That's very interesting because what changed? Like, if it might be, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like some, something I've been broke, like reading about and broaching, like uh, 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 enrollments in public speaks have been falling as a share and in private has been growing. So there might be some. I wonder if it's there's a like a you know how in popular demographic studies there's a, a transition from like high fertility rates to low that every country goes through. So I wonder if there's something similar for. So you think it's kind of improvement or everything's going or the quality that's like is the public school that's getting better? The private school. Let, let's take one more. Sorry. sorry, this would be very interesting, but we're on really tight on time. So let's take one more question from Jaid. And then, uh, then we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, hi, everyone. No, my question was more in the line of what the, the other person was asking. I mean, how, how do you justify that? What, what are what are the hypotheses? I understand that you see the numbers and you're just saying, okay, the, these are the results. But what are the hypotheses behind? And when you talk about the other studies uh, abroad, uh, what were their hypotheses when they analyzed this this case? Okay, um, Shai. Uh, Thank you for the question. This is great. I'm not, I'm, this is something I'm going to be investigating now, but I feel like in the literature, some of the reasons that uh, public schools get an advantage is labor, labor relations. They're more stable. They all have tenure. They get, they're less prone to be fired. And as schools, private schools are getting a big push. And my, I think one hypothesis might relate to scalability. They're scaling and they might not be doing, they might not know how to do it. Right and be doing, they're losing quality as they scale. <laughs> My colleague Hanata is waving, and we see this happening very intensely in uh, higher education. Right. Okay. Thanks once again, Eduardo. Okay, and sharing. Sorry. <laughs> and what you need to the the stop sharing. Okay, needs to. No, the, the, yeah. So. Which doesn't need to be Okay, Fabiana. So, hi everyone. I'm Fabiana. I'm from the auditing program that's Learn Design Technology. Uh, so, today I present my master project, a study the teacher has. Um, so, first, I'll introduce who is behind Tubby. Uh, then I'll describe the problem that we're addressing in our approach. After I'll present some pre preliminary results regarding another study that we conduct on April and our next steps of the study. So that is a group effort. Actually, uh, I have been working with two classmates, Sihal and Yulina. We are all educators uh, which with teaching experience. So, uh, I think our experience led us to recognize a problem um, that was well described by Darius White in our learning study. Uh, he said, tools are spending, but time is true. So we can go through a teacher's epic um, journey to help us better understand this quote. So I uh, will present like Alice, she's like a high school a novice teacher who wants to increase her class engagement. Uh, so her first step is discovery. So she needs like to search and narrows down like we have like many tools um, available. So then she needs to evaluate the tool based on screenshots, description, like what user reviews. Um, and she finally locates one tool and then she starts to learn the tool. So she needs like to read some tutorial, see some videos on YouTube, and figure out how to use the tool by herself. Uh, eventually, uh, she needs to design the activity that's from scratch that she's going to apply in her classroom. So 
there are two main challenges here uh, in this long process. First, uh, there's a steep learning curve. And second, the understanding how those tools can accommodate teaching practice. Because it's not about the tool, it's about how you use it. But the tool is not the, uh, the goal, but it's only a tool. Uh, so our focus in this project is how might we make edtech to integration in teaching practice easy and efficient. Uh, our learning contests are novice teachers like Alice, and we want to help her to build more confidence in integration of technology in the classroom, uh, build knowledge on teaching strategies, and feel a strong sense of community. And our process of doing this is that first teachers will search utilizing technology to filter the content. So this is how our search page will look like. We have like some um, filters like category, subject, and edit tools. Uh, this is an example of some results when a teacher clicks on that. This is an example of the results that the teacher had. So when they be able like to click on an activity, they will be shown a template uh, that will help them to use the edtech for classroom activity. And clicking on example, they will be able to see a work example that shows how the template might be adapted in the classroom. Uh, the next step is plan is backed by Fogg's behavior change theory. Uh, so, plan, I say plan, right? Okay, it's plan. <laughs> when teachers, uh, for example, they will be able to highlight what they like about, like for example, this example. And when they highlight the post, uh, there'll be a pop-up window where they can leave notes, save, and set a calendar reminder uh, for when they want to use the template. The third step is adapt, is allow teachers to engage further with the content. They will be able to make copies of the templates and expert posts and change them for their own context, saving like a lot of time. Uh, last step is to share and contribute to the community. So we have the community practice theory. Uh, if they click on share, they will be able to share and upload their own adopted templates. So, for example, they can, we will encourage them to share, uh, to show how they use the, their templates in their context. So to understand if and how Tubli can help teachers, um, we conduct a learning study this paper. So we had two groups of teachers. We provide the first group with only the template and the second one with the template plus a work example. Um, this, those images are regarding Jamboard, but we also had templates, materials related with Padlet and Nearpod. Um, we also provide uh, the teachers with different colors of post-it notes, um, <coughs> representing different public functions like adapt, ask, and like. We had a pre and post survey to measure uh, their confidence level using their tech tools and a post experience survey. So I will represent the results uh, connecting with our research questions. So the first question was regarding the value of the work examples. So analyzing the pre and post survey, we saw that teachers in the group two, the ones that had their work examples, they increased their confidence level in their tech tools. In this graph, for example, on the right side, you can see like the group two in the post post how their confidence level like, was higher. Uh, this graph is about Neopod, basically. Uh, and this result told us that with the examples can indeed help teachers better learn and tech tools. Uh, our second question is regarding collaboration. We observed that teachers organically collaborate during the study without instructions, but we know that in person is different from online environment. So we still need to gather more data about this. And finally, to answer our third question regarding how teachers uh, will apply what they learn, we collect the blue post-it notes, the one was uh, the adapt function. 
to see how they would adapt our templates. And in this table, we can see some of their ideas uh, to use each of uh, the each ad tech to that represented. Uh, so next steps, we now we need to better understand how to categorize uh, different teaching activities so we can further help teachers to search and find materials. We already start to build, build a database uh, of activities to explore some frameworks on how to categorize them. Uh, because we want to teachers to be able to connect the, the templates with teaching activities. Uh, we also create a blog to simulate our platform. Um, and we want to connect with more teachers for our digital feedback. Like you can go to the, to the blog, it's live. <laughs> and if you have like some feedback, it would be amazing also. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, so so Fabian has actually reserved some extra time for questions. No, I, I didn't. Yes, she did. <laughs> <laughs> so we can have a longer discussion of her work. Than, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think there is, is there, Boris. Is there Boris? Boris, you do you have a question? Oh no, it's just a hand there. Oh, just uh, I think it's the, just the. Okay, never mind. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a question. So, what 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 other platforms are there that do the same thing? Because oh. my, my wife uses uh, something called Teachers Pay Teachers. Yeah, Teachers Pay Teachers, you have like to buy uh, the materials that some teachers provide. So, uh, and the material is like already there. You know, like everything is already done. The idea is to provide like for free a template where you can adapt your own context. Like Teachers Pay Teachers, the teachers put their whole material there with. You cannot adapt there right. sometimes. Yeah, it's more difficult. Or you can after you. Yeah, but it's, yeah, exactly. it's yeah. Just more, a little bit more difficult. Yeah, so. <laughs> Other questions? Um, Fabi, does the group um, is planning to go forward with the project and making it a real business? Or That's actually interesting because uh, as we are three, like I'm from Brazil, Irina is from here, and Neha is from China. Uh, so we are doing like everything in English mm -hmm. and like talk more with teachers here, but it's actually interesting because when I talk with teachers in Brazil, they seem more interested actually in the product than the teachers here. Mm -hmm. Maybe then we don't have teachers pay teachers there, right? <laughs> yes. So um, I don't know if I want personally go for that. I don't see myself as a business woman. Mm -hmm. But Irina really wants to. So, and she was thinking about maybe starting Brazil. We can like do something like that. Yes. So, but, I, but I thought there would be help. Mm -hmm. yes. Interesting. Yeah. So, I wonder if you could um, partner with some in, in a, you know, some organization in Brazil like Nova Scuola, where they have like a strong community based on lesson plans. Mm -hmm. They might be interested in like doing an add on for. Um, Technology. Thank you. Yeah. It's also a place that's just kind of ripe for um, a good field experiment where you really can, beyond just kind of getting the qualitative response, but really trying to see to what extent it moves and changes um, the way that teachers are preparing for and students' performance in classes. Yeah, we actually had a, we, I saw, I showed the results the pre and post survey but we also had like another survey because we send the teacher the templates yeah and after two weeks we send them like a survey asking if oh did you use the material how was that but we only had like one teacher answer she just say oh i use the templates <laughs> <laughs> and we were like oh okay i mean like <laughs> like if, a couple of things i think would be kind of nice extensions if you if you wanted to do those or if any of you you know kind of keep on working on this research like one, um, to really do it at a school level and to really just kind of flood a school um, with, yes, you could and, but have some comparison schools mm -hmm. to try to see what happens and to do some things like time diaries with the teachers, um, some spot checks where you're actually looking in at what they're doing on their math, for example. And then also uh, trying to actually track test scores a little bit because like all these things are out there, but there's not a lot of great evidence, right? That they're necessarily moving the needle and in some sense, there's there's even some evidence, right, that they might be substituting for teachers' practice, which could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing, though, as well. 
And so, you know, it'd be worthwhile to just get some more on this because this is a great first step. Um, the hard part is it's been really hard to kind of put something in the field in these things. So as you go forward, if you could do that, that would be a great contribution. Okay. So just, just to conclude, I just want to say, I, I loved the, the initial framing of your problem that the tools are proliferating, but time is shrinking. And I think that's exactly, I mean, that's the dilemma that teachers face, right? Is mm -hmm. there are all these resources available and trying to figure out how to access them and which ones are good and which ones are not and which ones will work with these students is a huge problem. I mean, it, you know, it should make teaching easier, but in fact, in many ways, it makes it harder. So you know, finding a solution to that problem is 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 God's work. That's mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the right thing to do, so great. Yeah, okay. well, especially, I don't know how it works in the US, the procurement process, but in Brazil, if it's like I don't, I don't think uh, departments are giving a lot of support to teachers about like you should use like the business like tools we approve of or not. Their teachers are in the dark. Yeah, so. I think that's another point. That's why the teachers that I talk in Brazil were more interesting because here in the U.S. they already have like the what is the name like not the school the department no district district, district. Mm -hmm. they already have like some tools that yeah, they buy because they, they buy. The teachers like have to exactly, and in Brazil, I feel like Brazil it's just teachers yeah. like trying it out without having any sort of like support exactly. or okay. So, thank you, Fabiana. Excellent, all right, and uh, and I. Hi everyone, or who don't know, my name is Renata, um, and I'm studying um, the technical and vocational education level at the high school level in Brazil um, in the terms of the ANCC reform. And I'm studying two case studies um, using this, this common core report. Um, from now on, from now on, instead of saying technical vocational education, I'm going to say team bed, just so everyone know. Um, okay, let's see. How to... Okay, so first, um, the roadmap for today, I'm going to go through my research questions, a little bit of background, um, the conceptual framework I'm using for this research, and on, on my findings, I have already some general lessons and some variations among the two states that I'm studying. Um, and also some next steps that I'm already thinking that can go, I can, I can go on, or even the new students that are here um, watching this presentation today. Okay, so uh, my research questions. I'm studying how our state's implementing TVET track at the high school level after BACC. And I'm thinking about course, um, course offerings, how teachers are being hired and training, trained, how is this all being conducted? What are the biggest challenges for those states? And, and now, um, now, today I'm, I'm, I'm talking to um, Rio Grande do Sul and Sao Paulo, and I'm also starting to talk to Ceará. Um, so it's very interesting to see those differences as we are talking about a federalist country or where all of our states work in a different way, can work in a different way regarding um, education. Um, I'm also studying how our relationship with partner implementers being established and what are partner implementers. In TVET, a lot of times the states doesn't have the, the, the know-how to implement a TVET in a scalable way. Um, so they are hiring partners to implement that. And I'm also um, relating it to my conceptual framework, which is the borrowing and leg legitimization approach. So here I'm gonna give a brief background. Um, here in 2014, we had the National Plan of Education, PNE, established in Brazil with um, plans for the next 10 years. And um, uh, last uh, next year will be 
the, the 10th year, 2024. And for 2024, the country planned to triple the number of TVET students being 50% of that in public schools. So we have that, that scalability to be done that will not be done just so you know. <laughs> and we are also we also have the in 2017 the new high school common core approved by Congress um, with the possibility of TVET being in one of the five possible tracks that students could go through. Um, and here I have some background uh, updates on these backgrounds. I think most of you know that we have we had a lot of um, protests in the last couple of months about the dissatisfaction in terms of uh, implementation of BNCC, including the TVET track. Um, and now our national government suspended the required implementation right now. However, states are already, already changed the way they're working. Um, they're already working with those five, five tracks. And the government also is now implementing a survey, surveying the population and students to decide what are the possible changes in the common core in the BNCC. Um, so this is all, um, I didn't go through this in my research, but this is an important background to give you. So here, I'm just going to go briefly, I'm, I'm using the policy borrowing in education framework and legitimization framework to, to think how when we, how when we work with this policies that work so well in other countries, it might not go very well in our country if we don't think about specific um, some um, some specific things that just happen here. And then I have this um, this um, this phrase here that when we when we borrow a TVET and other po educational policies, other public policies, we need to build a whole set of structures to support the idea of BNCC in our country. Um, just implementing some pieces will not succeed this policy. So here I'm gonna go through some general lessons and then variations between the two states that I, I have studied. Okay, so first, um, um, first lesson course offering and curriculum. So both Sao Paulo and Rio Grande do Sul, um, before they start offering TVET, they made um, an interest survey with students to check their interest in TVET before offering, but not always the interests were the ones, the, the courses that they could actually offer. And this misled students' expectations in both states. That's why, that might be why we are having so many protest, protests right now. Um, and here in some blurbs of my, my qualitative um, research, they say that what happened in many cases was that school didn't have the infrastructure um, for uh, a technology course, and then they they couldn't offer it. And then um, it, in some in some some states, they even um, tried to offer, and students were for more, more than a month without without having class because of lack of structure. Second lesson: teacher hiring, training, and integration. So a quick expansion like those two and most of states are uh, aiming to demands quick and effective teacher training and st uh, states are not thinking about a long-term TVET teacher training po policy. And this we can relate um, with regular teacher training, but even for me, it's even more difficult because we need people who who can have all the ped pedagogy um, um, skills, but also these very technical skills. Um, I've seen that partners have less difficulty with teacher hiring, but what will happen if the policy expand in the way they're planning to? And here I mean, for some partners, implementers, they, have, they are dealing with um, five schools right now, but if we want to expand the way um, we are talking right now, um, they might, they, even the partners might not have this expertise. 
Um, then um, general challenges of BNCC. Also, um, so also um, all, all of them, all of those two states, they mention how, how will the assessment of FIVET students will be done? Because how, how are we going to evaluate the students? Because we are evaluating here people to be actually working there. Um, we are putting the name of the partner implementer or the, or the, the state to a, a profession. Um, so this has to be thought with a lot of, with being very careful about it. Um, also, um, I've seen that curriculum hours can harm TVET students who want to take a name test because those students would have less um, um, regular courses study and a lot of partners have been, um, uh, partners and policymakers uh, were talking a lot about it. Um, and how to work with a competency curriculum, uh, also a, a lesson, and the students' feedback that I told you in the beginning. So they are having a lot of bad students' feedback by now. Um, some variations. So for Sao Paulo, um, I've seen that the state had a very fast implementation. They made some mistakes and they are already in the, their third implement, uh, implementation phase. So fast implementation and fast pivoting for them. Um, and, and for Rio Grande do Sul, um, they, are, they are testing smaller pilots, but they are still unsure about the future. So I've seen that Sao Paulo um, knows what they're gonna do in the future. They, um, they abolished, the partner implementer, um, um, the partner implementer to be with them. It will be all state um, because of their learnings. And Rio Grande do Sul are still doing with implementers, but unsure about the future. So last slide. Uh, right now, I'm doing the second round of interviews with some actors and also interviewing Ceará. And for next steps, as I, I told, um, told in the beginning, it could be for anyone who wants to keep studying this. Um, so how can we articulate those learnings for a better review of BNCC? And also it would be great to st study students' opinion and teachers' opinions over that, because I couldn't go through that. Great. Yes. Thank you, Renata. We have time for a couple of questions. I have a question. Uh, Anna? For those two uh, departments you study, uh, Sao Paulo and Grande Sul, mm -hmm. did you see that? Um, do you think that TFAT is uh, a, a very sort of like different realm for them, or is it? If my question is, if they do well, like teacher training for the like standard basic education, they they're more likely to do well, like TFAT teacher training, or or do you think it's like very different skills and I think it's very different because they need to hire teachers that are that know some vocation. I mean, some some technical vocation. So it's it's very hard for them. And what I notice is that partners like System ISC, for example, they they know very well how to hire, and they they have those teachers, but. It, what will happen when, if we need to scale the way the country wants to scale? We are not being, we are not preparing for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, Renata. Thank you for your presentation. I, um, I'm curious to know what are your expectations about Sierra? Uh, will be, but like the difference among Sierra, uh -huh. but. Uh, I haven't started the, the interviews with Sarah, but I, be, I believe the general lessons will be the same. So course offering, curriculum, teacher hiring, I believe will be the same and the challenges with being used to say it. Um, but I'm very, I'm very, I'm looking forward to know the differences because it was very different to see the way of uh, São Paulo and Rio Grande do Sul are doing this in a very different way. So I'm sure it will always, it will always be, it will also be different there. 
Yeah, because it's interesting that you're adding Sarah because some Paulo and Incluso have like a, a very high uh, budget. Yes. Right? Sarah is a different okay. profile. All right, we have to stop. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> just a quick one. Just a quick one. Renata. Renata. Just a quick one. Renata. Uh, just, uh, let me introduce myself. Yeah, you're, you're on. What's that? You're, you're on. Go. No, no, just, I just want to introduce myself to Renata and say that I'm <laughs> very into this project right now. Uh, and I'll, I'll be calling you to see, you know, to further discuss this Great. issue. Great. Let's talk, Jay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I thought I was the last one. No, you're not the last one. <laughs> <laughs> you're the best. Sorry, no. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> We have 10 minutes, right? I have 10 minutes. So, uh, thank you very much for everyone that is here, especially my ICERS uh, companions for hearing this for the fourth time. <laughs> <I'm counting. laughs> uh, and also, uh, to obviously, to Karnoy and Gabriel that has been helping in this research. Uh, it's been a pleasure to study that, actually. So um, I'm Tamiris, for those who doesn't know me. So um, studying the relationship between Black teachers and the test scores of Black students in the Brazilian public schools. Uh, basically, I'm studying that because uh, we had some studies here in the US saying that there was a positive effect, potential positive effects of black, the Black teachers to soften the disparities between Black and white students' test scores. So considering that Brazil has a large uh, labor force of black teachers, like 30% of the teachers are black or brown, uh, which is more than half a million teachers, uh, there's a potential to explore their positive impact on the students and use that in the public policies toward inequality. And also there are just a few uh, topics, a few studies, quantitative studies of this topic in Brazil. So uh, this also might be a very good contribution to the field. So my research paper uh, was intended to address the effects of black teachers presence in public schools on the black students test scores in Brazil. I just wanna highlight that this is a correlational study, so I cannot establish causality. So I would never be able to say the black teachers in fact, the black students or damage them or make them better or whatever. So uh, just to give you some uh, more content on the, the, this topic, basically we are analyzing this from two perspectives, the positive impacts of the, the teachers and the negative impacts you view when we have the same race teachers in the class. So from the positive perspective, there are studies saying that uh, the presence of the black teacher there can uh, increase the test scores, uh, course grades, uh, also like the disciplinary outcomes, attainment, and expectations about students. There's this whole thing called culturally relevant pedagogy that is a more adept pedagogy for black people that considers their, their uh, origins, ethnic uh, origins, and etc. And also the role modeling, which is the idea that if I have a black teacher there, I have someone that understands my context, and I rec can recognize myself in, in him or her, and uh, learning increases. From the negative perspectives, we have the, the cases of stereotyping and implicit bias, which is when we have teachers that actually uh, have lower expectations of all the black students, uh, they think they are less intelligent, they think they have, they have uh, lower capacity, 
uh, they commit aggressions and uh, avoid talking about racism in, in schools. Uh, they are racist, racist sometimes. So a lot of practices, teacher teaching practices involving racism. So my questions for my research were: How do test scores of black students relate to the number of black teachers in the Brazilian public schools? And what factors could interact with this potential uh, effects that we found? Uh, we had two dependent uh, dependent variables. One, it was the test score gap between black and white students. We also analyzed black and brown because in Brazil we have uh, a huge um, issue with uh, self and education. Uh, and we also we looked into that because we wanted to understand the impact on uh, inequality, not only in the test scores. And we look at to the second second dependent variable, which, which was test score of black students, because uh, if we found something in the test score gap, we would, we would like to understand where was the, what the, the impact happening, the white students or the black students. Uh, we uh, our my main dependent variable was the percentage of black black teachers in the municipality or in the school. We had two levels of analysis in this research, which was municipal and school, and we control for socioeconomic status of the students in the municipality or in the schools, teacher quality, we use a bunch of variables to make a proxy of teacher quality. We know that teacher quality is a very like big issue and difficult to understand. So uh, I'm not gonna say that this is teacher quality. We also look into the percentage of black students in the municipality and in the school, in, in the school because we were also interested to know uh, if the, bigger concentration of black students of was also affecting this. Uh, we also looked to gender of the students and our baseline was 2007 to 2017. And we also separated the quartiles uh, according to, to socioeconomic status. I tried to summarize my findings uh, instead of showing you the tables, but I know that you are all familiar with a lot of tables. But basically, what we found at the municipal level in the fifth grade is a negative uh, impact and a negative effect of black teachers and the female test scores. Just to summarize, in terms of my timing, is um, for the fifth grade and mostly for the ninth grade in the school level, we found that the black teachers are helping to not helping but are related and i'm going to apologize for my language i'm still working on that <laughs> uh statistical language but they have a correlation with a decrease in the gap uh, in test scores between black and whites uh, and this varies a lot in terms of uh females math and language uh, and the 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 socioeconomic group and we have a case in the ninth grade, the municipal level, where they help to increase the gap. This is super nice. And uh, Colonel I was like, yay, be happy for a while. Uh, but, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to show you that, but um, when we go to, when we, we um, when we analyze the second part, which was the test score uh, effect on the student, what we found is that actually, those test scores are the, the gap is decreasing because the white students are going worse. Or uh, in the case of the ninth grade, because the black students, everyone is going worse, mm. but the whites are going even worse. So this is not the correct language again, I'm sorry. But uh, we are trying, we are in this moment of trying to understand more or less. Uh, what could be causing those effects? Because uh, what we were hoping, we, we were hoping when we started the research was actually to find no effect. Because there's a difference in terms of uh, structural, uh, race, structural racism between Brazil and US, which is here, uh, black teachers, they have this ethnic racial uh, identity very well developed. Uh, in Brazil, we don't have that, so we were expecting, and they don't have training, a lot of things are happening, so we were expecting no effect, not negative effects. So um, we are right now, uh, I'm gonna, not going to, but they are beautiful tables. <laughs> it was very nice to put them together. So the discussions that I'm uh, actually having right now with Carnoy and Pedro and a lot of people in the field is what is, ha what is happening here. So. Um, 
it might be that we have some uh, municipal and school characteristics that we are not taking uh, into account in the model. So uh, we don't know if uh, the school have the proper infrastructure, infrastructure. We don't know if the director, the principal is the best one. Uh, we also don't know if this is something that we, we can investigate and I'm still investigating until we finish my research. If the white students that are there are the, 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 the students that uh, like the, we cannot compare them with private private uh, school students, white students that go to private schools. So we are trying to understand which kind of white student is, is in this, uh, appearing in this research. We also are thinking about teacher allocation because we should consider that the best teachers, uh, like the teachers are allocated firstly for their uh, ranking the test, uh, the, the assessment that they apply to enter in the, the district, probably the best teachers go to the best schools. And when we analyze the school level, the most, the biggest impacts are in the, the bottom 25. So it's very likely that something uh, ha is happening here. Also college of the pre-service training, especially in mathematics, because a lot of the impacts relates to math. So maybe teachers are not so well prepared to teach math in the ninth grade as they are in the fifth grade or in the fifth grade is already difficult. College of in-service training, so lack of preparation to promote an interested education. That was what I was explaining before. Weak racial ethnic identification, which I mentioned also, and uh, discrimination and racism, and uh, also the condition of mental health of the black teachers. Because if you consider that racism is a kind of condition those people experience, there is no reason to uh, not believe they uh, do not suffer the same as the students. So um, yeah, I still have a lot of time and <laughs> material to discover what is happening in my research. And I hope this is a contribution to the racial inequality uh, topics and studies in Brazil. So okay. yeah, thank you very much. Okay, hey, other questions for Tamiris? Um, I know that like, no time for this right now. <laughs> but my question is more like, do you feel like you want to continue with this after? Because I think I can see how some qualitative interview could like really uh, help you to dig more into these questions. Uh, a lot of people ask me that. I mean, this could be like a PhD topic because there's so many things to explore. Uh, and also even on the quantitative side, I mean, this is just like the, uh, top of the iceberg because it's like you have so many things that you can so many pathways that you can go um, right, right now sorry it's me <laughs> right now I'm actually happy that I, I I chose not to do a mixed methods because I wouldn't even know how to start a qualitative research from here because again you can go to a lot of ways and this is like the national data I mean probably if we wanted to do some kind of qualitative uh, data there study, uh, it should be better to analyze just one state or like a, a micro universe that I could identify people to talk. So, but yeah, if you want to give me a scholarship for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. What you need is time, right? You need to have time to do the interview. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, I think it's very interesting the work you're doing because how to transplant, right? I think the same way you cannot transplant policies, you cannot transplant like findings from other countries into the context. So it's very yeah. important to understand what are the relationships and how identity and culture and like how racism is happening in school in Brazil. So and how to affect the teachers. So it's very yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you.
bigger. Sorry, guys, the new computer I'm learning. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, hi, everyone. So, this is the title of my work Sex Education in Brazil, a comparison um, of national policy with, with UNESCO's guidelines. So, to start, I just want to highlight here some um, news from this year and from last year. So uh, after talking school, adolescent uh, report uh, sexual abuse from her stepdad, a new anti-gay law in Uganda calls for life in prison for those who are convicted. Uh, Jesus in Santa Catarina, in Pedro Menina, Jones Supranda de Fundaraborto. Floyd expands don't say gay house or case anti LGBTQ abuse. Uh, so, really recent news just to reflect on. And another reflection that I want to uh, propose for you is to like think about how was your sex ed, like when you were young uh, in your schools or in your families. I will give you four seconds for that. <laughs> um, well, here we have a lot of people from different different backgrounds, gender. Um, uh, you lost the reflection part. <laughs> uh, age, background. So, uh, and I'm pretty sure that that uh, the answer for this question is very similar. Uh, probably you have like one or two classes bio biology or a really awkward conversation with your uh, dad or your with your mom. So if you have something like that, right? So uh, this kind of experience is very, very common. And several studies suggest that a better approach is a comprehensive sexuality education approach. So talking not only about uh, pregnancy and STIs, but also talking about sexuality, gender, uh, pleasure, relationship, feelings, respect, violence, body, etc., media. So, um, so one definition of CSC uh, that UNESCO suggests is that it's a curriculum-based uh, process of teaching and learning about cognitive, emotional, physical, and social aspects of sexuality that aims to empower people to realize their health, well-being, and dignity. And there is significant evidence that CSC contributes to improvement uh, in gender equality, sexual and reproductive health, gender-based violence prevention, um, STIs and sexual violence prevention. But despite the increasing international recognition of CSC uh, importance in school and public um, policy, there is little, there's, there have, sorry, there has been little progress in the implementation of CSC in schools or public policy uh, around the world. And, and I'll say CSC for advanced sexual education. So the purpose of my studies is to investigate the current um, landscape of sex ed in Brazil and compare Brazil's policy with UNESCO guidelines. Just a pretty quick uh, view of my conceptual framework. So I argue that public policy on sex ed in Brazil is uh, built on a complex process of, process of power. So we can see the global guidelines on sex ed and feminist and queer movements acting on um, um, at, uh, impacting Brazil's public policy in a more progressive direction and the conservative and liberal tendencies uh, impacting in the opposite direction. Um, and the image also demonstrates the interrelations of these different perspectives. Okay, so those are my research questions. So how does Brazil's sex ed is aligned with global education bodies? What is the state of sex ed in Brazil? And to what extent does the content of these documents reflect ideas from feminist and queer movements and ideas from conservative movements? Um, so my methods and data. So I, I am doing a qualitative research using document analysis. Uh, specific, specifically, I conduct a comparative case study anal um, anal well, sorry analyzing uh, of sex ed topics in education po public policy from Brazil and UNESCO. And I selected some uh, current national policy in Brazil regarding curriculum. 
from my experience and from literature review on, and from uh, specialists, I I knew of a uh, document that I had to select. Five minutes, okay, let's go. And <laughs> so I coded the documents uh, using deductive and inductive uh, methods. So those are the documents I selected and analyzed it. So for curriculum public policy, we have Peña from 2013, saying that is analyzing. PCN from 97, 98, uh, national curriculum parameters. Our common core, the NCC from 2018. And for teacher training, the basic information up to uh, also uh, both in service and pre service uh, teacher training. Our national is like a national common base for teacher education and for international guidelines, the UNESCO document. Findings and discussion, let's go. So uh, I, I kind of divided in three uh, themes. So comprehensive, uh, the UNESCO and PCN, PCN, yes, PCN is easier, uh, present diversity of themes related to sex ed, and they are they frame in a way of, uh, that can be uh, put in the comprehensive uh, sexual education aspects, uh, approaching so the cognitive, emotional, physical, and social aspects of sexuality. Conser I name I name it conservative uh, sexual education. The approach uh, restricted to some particular topics such as pregnancy, STIs, or uh, reproductive system. So the BNCC presents only two mentions uh, about STIs and only one mention about sexuality, poverty, and pregnancy, and they are all restricted to the eighth grade uh, in science course. And I named nothing aware never. Uh, to represent the absence of sex ed themes in the documents. So BBC from BBC from Aston, the teacher training uh, curriculum, and Peña are in this category. And Peña has a rare exception, uh, just observation uh, note, with one mention about sexual violence prevention. Now looking closer to some issues, um, two things I think were interesting to notice here. One thing is, is that the document um, regarding the PCA and it is from 1967 in 2009 and 2018. Uh, so there is not possible to consider that UNESCO had impact on PCA, right? Because uh, PCA was before uh, UNESCO publication. So we can consider the influence of uh, local progressive movements at the time in Brazil, in Brazil, such feminist and queer movements at the time. Um, Another interesting thing, I, and I, I call like progressive uh, topics, uh, such uh, abortion, homosexuality, pleasure, prostitution, masturbation, and other taboo things, the PCN has more of these topics than UNESCO. Again, uh, maybe emphasizing the local, uh, local impact, local culture, um, and maybe a uh, potential impacts of conservative wave uh, on global organization like UNESCO. Uh, if we look, say, if we take in consideration like the chronolo chronological order of Brazilian documents, it's possible to observe that the oldest ones are more comprehensive and that the current ones are more, uh, have more a conservative approach or not, or do not talk at all about sex ed. Uh, and this may indicate the influence of local conservative tendencies in Brazil and uh, pushing back discussions and public policy on um, human rights. Finally, um, one critical thing to notice is that, okay, it's, maybe it's too small, but um, in all the documents, even those that we, have, we don't uh, see sex ed themes, we can find what I call like adjacents or related topics. So we can uh, maybe uh, label their like tiptoeing <laughs> topics. It's like with some effort. So, there are topics with some effort uh, we can relate to sex ed, for example, values, plurality, uh, integral education, ethics, autonomy, critical thinking, and citizenship. So uh, even being said for myself, the teacher training that I consider like, uh, there's no talk sex ed topics. There are a lot of these adjacent, adjacent <laughs> or related topics. Um, so while this lack of explicit focus on sex ed, does not legally prevent schools or uh, uh, even universities of uh, pedagogy to 
um, implement sex ed or uh, approach sex ed topics, they're also not uh, obligated to do it, right? So the situation underscores the need for clear and direct public policy uh, sex ed to provide legal empowerment to promote uh, um, better teacher training in sex ed for educators. Some conclusions. Uh, so in Brazil's public policy on sex ed in general present a low degree of alignment with uh, UNESCO's uh, comprehensive, comprehensive sexual education and apparently is getting more conservative with time and CSC is not mandatory, but it's not, also not prohibited. And I think that's it. Thank you for that. Hey, thank you, Natalia. Any questions? Uh, Natalia, uh, it's great to see the evolution. You just got the new documents. When you can you go back? Oh, did you? Oh, sorry. no, no, don't worry. I, can't. It's just, I was going to ask like when you're those, uh, the y axis, it's like the total number of words. Yeah, uh, yeah, the, the codes. Uh, okay, it's not the specific, specifically, specifically the words, but but like, like the theme, like when it, the topic uh, came out. Okay, so I was just wondering, it, like for the and uh, Bain to say there's like bigger bars because it's a longer talk. Bain to for myself. Bain uh, The teacher training. They so, talk a lot about values, six and sheep, but not about sex ed. Yeah, but it's Bain to say is a longer document. Bain to say for myself is like 15 pages, and both are like, if we combine them, 30 pages. Bain to say for myself for e service and pre service. Okay. Teacher training. So you said that, that you know, that these. That these topics are not mentioned in the curriculum, but they are also not prohibited. Yes. Do you have examples of places where, in fact, there is a curriculum that that includes uh, what you call CSA and yeah. comprehensive sex education? So that's my next step for PhD. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to, uh, yeah, like I really want to uh, maybe compare some seats, some uh, states or cities uh, or some schools to see. If uh, some of them are implemented. I have the example that I uh, I used to work and well, I work in like five different schools and two of them, they had, is uh, it was not comprehensive sexual education per se, but they they approach uh, better or more than just two biology classes. But it's like they could, see, but but they were really afraid of the mm. uh, the families and. But so they they had a really deep uh, and long conversation with families before uh, approaching. Yeah, do you know what I wonder now? Like how if it's correlated at all? If the school is more likely to teach like African history, are they also more prone to teach, to teach like SES? Because like, mm -hmm. yeah, so. they might be like a more conservative, yeah. like neighborhood. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. But it's hard to tell from like just looking at them. Yeah, the documents. Yeah, I, I should. I, I think for this we have to go into schools and do research. Do observation. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank, Thank you, Natalia. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, we've ended on time, yeah. uh, so uh, it's wonderful to hear about the work that you're doing, and we do, I think, have a party in progress <laughs> so you're welcome to have some well, we have to get a picture of them with a the little uh, oh, with, <laughs> are these hats okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just, just Jair has a has a comment. So, ah uh, yes. Just one one moment, Jair has a comment. You can put your hats on. Yeah, Jair. Yeah. Yeah. I always have comments, but but. The, just, just, so, so, so Natalia knows, I mean, before the pandemic, this was a big issue in the state of Secretaria Estadual São Paulo. We brought, there was this pesquisadora from Harvard, I'm trying to recall her name. She came over and she, she we were working on that. And that was a priority like five, four years ago. With the pandemic, that became like a huge, uh, not priority. And it should be, but at the time, uh, the, the, what they found out is that sexual dysfunction was increasing like twice to double in the last five to 10 years because of uh, deep porn. So I am just saying that this is uh, should come back 
to, to the Raider in some of the secretarias because this is a big issue for, for young kids. Uh, good to know, thank you. Thanks, Shay. And Denise, if you have a, a brief comment. Yes, thanks uh, everybody. Uh, it was great. And uh, just, just a comment from Natalia's presentation. Uh, I in PNLD and uh, I, uh, it was, was mandatory to um, um, retirar the word uh, sex or gender from the books in the last four years. Just uh, uh, and it is it it was uh, and the BNCC was do uh, has was done in, at this time too. So mm -hmm. it was a really uh, regression. Thanks yeah, a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Denise. Okay, and thank you once again. So put your hats on and let's go. Okay, and those of you online, thank you very much for coming. Okay. All right. Go. We'll see you in September. Uh, 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 uh,